Greg Romanzo. Welcome to Bitstall Radio. Ah, thanks. This is the second third party logistics conversation I've had in like two weeks, JB Sacedo, for people who didn't listen to that episode, also in the 3PL industry, but you were in a different part of the business. Explain in layman's terms what RR and F logistics does. We're a middleman in the trucking space. Um, it's a business uh, most people have never heard of, but it is a three or four hundred billion dollar market. And really, what it's about, or, or why it exists, is that there are three million plus trucks on the road in the United States, and three hundred or four hundred thousand trucking companies in the U.S. So you have a very fragmented supply of trucking capacity in the United States. That means anyone that needs to ship product, uh, you know, uh, in a sort of business to business context. Um, really doesn't know who to call, right? And um, so that means that there's this large uh, industry of uh, middlemen that help kind of make those connections, right? Connect a, a shipper that needs to move something. How did you get um, into it? it, was a, it I was in the space uh, right out of college, you know, kind of first job out of college. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess the rest is history. It's all I've ever done uh, up to this point. So, yeah, so it's, um, it's a pretty... Job, and how did you get into starting your own company? Uh, I left that company uh, with uh, one of my colleagues and we uh, opened the business in 2004. So it was, um, you know, in inspired by the idea of, um, you know, I think, I think twofold, very, very entrepreneurial in the sense that, hey, we can, we can do this and we can do this better and, and carve out a living for ourselves. And, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, just, just trying to live the American dream. I think that's part of it, you know, trying not to get stuck in that, uh, you know, um, traditional kind of corporate, uh, slow moving culture. We wanted to hustle and go after it. The role of the middleman, the person who has the black box and can find the truck in the right spot and the driver in the right spot and bring them all together magically for the right price. Like that's now being disintermediated effectively by technology. Well, they're trying. How did you, they're trying. How did you think about that? Uh, I think that was, um, for me personally, that was one uh, reason why it was desirable to, um, you know, get a deal done with our business. You know, we were essentially still conducting the same business model as when I learned it when I started my career 20 years earlier. Um, and that scared me. Um, you know, just thinking about the, you know, kind of, uh, you know, Kodak example or something like that, where this, you know, business goes from king of the mountain to completely obsolete, you know, that, that was something that kept me up at night. So, um, how is that? Yeah. How is that impacting multiples in the industry? Like when you look out at at at, at multiples in the trucking space, the freight uh, brokering space, like is it depressing multiples based on the fact that the people can sort of see 20, 30, 40 years out, like we're not going to need these as many of these sort of middlemen roles. Like is it depressing multiples, or what? If, what impact um, is it having on multiples? I I don't I don't think it, it's as much of an impact as the current you know sort of uh, freight recession that's going on. I think that's really more of the you know kind of blinking red light. Um, I think that you know the space is viewed upon that it's going to go through some change and consolidation. But what I I don't think that the the um, you know technological disruption has really hit home yet. I think there's a lot of efforts um, chipping away at the sides. Um, their challenge in really getting, uh, you know, to flip this business upside down is that it's incredibly fragmented. And that's like I had explained in the beginning, that's kind of what, what makes the business exist of, mm -hmm. of being a broker in the space. Um, but there's a resistance to technology and change from both sides of the equation. So both on the shipper side and on the carrier side, there's just a general, I would say a general resistance to change. And it's more because of the fragmentation. There's a lot of smaller um, players in the space, uh, you know, on, on the shipper and, and carrier side. So it's really hard for um, one piece of technology, one platform, one concept to, um, you know, really get distributed throughout the, in, the entire network, right? So, you know, w one common, uh, you know, complaint you hear from carriers is that they need, you know, tons of apps on their phone to connect with all these brokers, right? So that's an example of, oh, the app, and it's on our phone and it's, you know, it, it works for us as consumers in e-commerce, but it doesn't work for a carrier because they don't want to manage through 50 or 60 apps, right, on their phone. So that's an example of 
the technology is there, but the but it hasn't really um, you know penetrated the industry in a meaningful way. So there is no um, one Uber of the trucking space. Well, Uber is in the trucking space, and interesting. Um, everything that I understand uh, about that business effort is it's uh, either struggling or failing. So you know, uh, I, I think that's sort of the case in point. And I think you know we. we it's it's sort of a you know uh, top of mind example for us, right? Um, the reason why I think it's failing is because the shipper clients are used to uh, this being an on demand business, right? And they don't want to go change their behavior to participate in the platform. They want they still expect service. They still expect um, their vendor to uh, you know mold into their business process and to. Uh, you know, kind of be seen and not heard rather than, well, I need to change my behavior to now participate in your platform. Well, that, how does that help me? I'm used to, you know, snap my fingers and someone is available to service me. And so if I'm, if I'm Dell Computer Corporation and I ship a truckload, a ton of computers every day, mm -hmm. I, like I, I've got on speed dial, dial my trucking, my freight people and I mm -hmm. don't want to change my behavior necessarily right. to go to some exactly. model that that's but I'd imagine it. the smaller companies that don't have the same cloud as a Dell would be more inclined to try a new platform. No? Uh, yes and no. I mean I think that you know you'll have the uh you know the sort of early adapters that want to you know see the bells and whistles. But you know at the end of the day the service experience has to be excellent. And I think that um that's where uh, some of these dis disruptors fall down as well is that, you know, it's this platform and this business idea and this, you know, change idea. Well, at the end of the day, are they delighting their customers? And uh, the results suggest maybe not from some yeah. of these disruptors. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the legacy providers, you know, can point to, hey, I have this 10 year relationship. I have this 20 year relationship, whatever it might be, you know, you know, we're, the, the the client and I are in love, right? And that's proofs in the pudding there. Yeah, yeah. Um, how's a freight brokering business valued? Is it a multiple of EBITDA or revenue, or like how do, how do you what what is the mechanism by which you value a freight brokering company? Uh, from everything that I've uh, seen in the marketplace and and personal experience, yeah, it's it's a, um, a multiple on EBITDA, but I think that there are um, you know other significant factors. In terms of uh, you know fit, um, customer spread, um, you know what what type of business, right? So you can broker a lot of different types of shipments, right? There's um, shipments that are you know if, if you think about um, you know walking through a Walmart, right? So there's um, you know boxes of food, there's you know packages of fresh food, right? That need to be temperature controlled. There are big fixtures that maybe need to go on a flatbed truck. Um, you know there's rush deliveries and all the moral of the story is all different, you know, types and sizes of shipments. So depending on, you know, what the broker specializes in um, and what the acquirer is looking for, you know, I think, uh, you know, impact that. So you can see, or in my experience, I've seen different, um, you know, examples based on, hey, we're looking for this one niche and it works really well for us versus, you know, we're one giant platform and we're trying to merge with another giant platform, right? Got it. So there's some freight forwarders you go like we we have refrigerated. You know we're we're like the refrigeration guys, right? So if you mm -hmm. need to sort, like set, set something cold, we're your guys. There's probably others like chemicals and things that are hazardous. Like right. they need to be you know dealt with differently. So what would the multiple range be again from what you've seen in the industry? Like from like low to high. High being we'll get into what maybe would, would make a, a freight board, a freight brokering business kind of more sure. highly valued than a lower one. But give me just, the, give me the range. What would what you Sure. Do. I, I would say the, the lowest range that you would see, uh, you know, for a very small and simplistic freight brokerage would maybe be three to five times EBITDA. And then, you know, some of the larger transactions that have happened in the space, yeah, approach 10, 11. Wow. And those would be sort of at the frothy peaks, uh, you know, of um, timing, but... And it varies in there again, based on those niches, size, um, you know, track record, that sort of stuff. Got it. Yeah. So let's walk you through um, what you guys did to sort of uh, make your business as attractive as possible. Um, maybe walk through how you were thinking about the business. I guess my first question is, did you always know 
that one day you would sell or you know, for a lot of, you know, particularly in, in an industrial kind of business, a lot of folks think, you know, I'll pass it down to my kids, right? Like when mm-hmm. I'm ready, I'll kind of pass. Was that sort of your, your plan? I know you had two other partners. Did you all think, well, we'll get our, you know, our kids involved or did you know one day there'd be an exit on the horizon? I think when we started the business, um, you know, the exits and, and acquisitions weren't, you know, in the vocabulary, right? It was, um, you know, the, the, the sort of moment we started, it was, you know, it was one of those, you know, kind of make ends meet, take care of, take care of your responsibilities and your families. And this is going to be our vehicle to do that. Right. So it was mm-hmm. a very, uh, I think kind of one dimensional, um, not seeing too far down the path. We, uh, you know, busted our tails in the beginning and, um, and saw success. But, um, what we saw was that, um, you know, we saw a business that couldn't survive without the three of us operating it every day. Right. And so the, the, the challenge became, uh, you know, how, how do we take this business, business to the next level? Right. So instead of us being self employed, we're really, you know, people that run a business model. And, and how many employees uh, were you at when you made that discovery? Was it just the three of you, or did you have a couple of helpers already on on? Uh, no, there, there there was a few. I think we were. Boy, I'm trying to think now. Um, uh, m- maybe we were, you know, eight to ten, right? Something like that. It was still pretty early in the ball game in the first few years, and it was. And- yeah, but a lot of people, Greg, like running a ten employee company, they're super happy, right? Like they, they're the Jason Cohen, another person we just had on the show, uh, King versus. Oh gosh, what's the analogy? It's like, do you want to be rich or king? I can't remember. But some people will have a ten employee company. They control everything. They're the hub and the spoke, and they're super happy. They're like, you know, I I get to carve out. Couple hundred grand a year in in, in mm-hmm. dividends, nice tax efficient. I don't want to complicate my life. Um, I can run my car through the business. I can run my vacations through the business. Sure, I'm good. Sure. I don't. I don't. I don't need all this scaling, growing stuff. Right. You and your partners though came to a different conclusion when you had half a dozen employees. You're like, no, we got to get this thing professionalized. Tell me why you like. What was sure. behind that decision? It's an, it's actually a very simple and easy answer, and we believe that uh, in our business, if you were not growing, you were going out of business. So we were committed to each year and each month, our business was going to be you know larger than the previous, and there just was not going to be you know th- th- there there wasn't going to be any exception to that, and and that's the way we operated the business. What's behind and, that philosophy? And, it's because there's a lot of companies that don't grow and they're super happy, right? Like they're, yeah. what was it that you thought in particular in the freight brokering business that if you weren't growing, you were dying? Right. The, I think the nature of the freight brokering business, you know, sort of demands this mindset. You are, uh, every day that you wake up, you're one phone call away from your largest customer leaving you. And, you know, in a lot of our training, you know, I would show, uh, Employees, you know, these are the top five customers in 2005, and these are the top five customers in 2010. And sometimes the the names would be totally different, right? So there was that constant churn. We worked on a lot of, um, you know, sort of uh, relational or transactional type relationships. So uh, we didn't have a contract to do business for a year or two years or anything like that. And essentially, each shipment that we handle for a customer was the audition for the next customer, right? So that sort of, you know, you proved your worth every day to your clients. You know, there was, there was no mindset of, Hey, you know, okay. You know, if, if my goal is uh, $10,000 a day in profit, that's all I need to hit. You know, that mindset, I think, um, you know, for us, we found lent itself to that uh, getting comfortable, um, you know, kind of getting set in your ways, it just, it just, we didn't believe that was a healthy way to run the business. And, um, so, you know, that's, that's the mindset that again turned us into, Hey, all right, we, we're kind of beginning to hit a ceiling here, right? I only have two arms and two ears and two eyes. So yeah. my ability, you know, my output is limited. No matter how many, you know, people I have sitting around me, you know, helping to, you know, pass off, we need to, we need to solve the problem. How do we turn some of the business creation? Um, and revenue, uh, you know, how do we get that in, into the arms of the employees and how do we empower 
uh, and enable our employees to take on that role. And that was that sort of moment, I think, where we began to, um, you know, convert the model from sort of self-driven, self-employed to, oh, this is really becoming a business model. This is becoming this sort of machine that every day is operating and running and growing. And, um, you know, that's where the hard work comes in. Um, but I want to... Uh, I want to get into that in a second. Before we do, though, though, let's just talk about your partners. Uh, I just did an interview uh, recently with a, a, a guy who had two partners, and each of the partners had very different views on the role of the company in order to fund the lifestyle. So the one <laughs> classic story is the one partner thought, I want a new truck. Why does he need a new truck? Well, because... Now I own a company and I would like to run a fancy truck through my company. And the other two were like, no, no, we're growing a business here. We can't take all that cash. And he's like, no, but I want it. Mm -hmm. So there was this sort of discrepancy around the role of the company as sort of a personal piggy bank for the founders versus mm -hmm. we're going to run this thing like it's a publicly traded company. Yeah. Um, and and I just wondered, did, did you and your partners have that conversation? How did you kind of stick handle that with your two partners? I think that um, that's a good question. I think that generally speaking, we we saw eye to eye on um, the um, you know the, the business being a vehicle to create wealth for us and to put us into a better place. Um, you know, in a day to day sort of you know, sh should we uh, you know take take more retained earnings or should we reinvest? Right, that's something that you have to talk through and. You know, and that's uh, that's just one of those examples of you know how a partnership has to work together and and uh, you know compromise and push and pull to to um, continue. Uh, Were you all at forward. similar stages in your life? Like uh, you know, I find that if the partnerships are at very different stages, so like one's thirty, the other's fifty-five. Mm -hmm. One wants to grow and has no, like less needs for cash. The 55 year old's more conservative, doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. want to take the risk. Like, where were you all like in life stage? Two of us were fairly close in age. And then um, one was um, about 15 years older. So, and how did that um, 15 year old, old gap impact your decision making? Well, frankly, he worked, outworked us both. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think the exception to the point you're trying to drive home, he was he he uh, he was the exception to that is what I should say, and um, you know so we really were on the same page in terms of hey this foot on the gas pedal mindset this is something special um, you know and we're all in this together and um, you know I think w one of the um, you know sort of un celebrated parts of, of this whole deal was the fact that our partnership was strong. And I was lucky to have two of the most, you know, talented and motivated partners, you know, to run a business with. Right. So uh, I guess from my perspective, it was easy because I had two great partners. Um, never would have happened without them and never would have been able to do it um, individually. And I think if each of us looked in the mirror, we would agree with that. So, you know, the partnership was more powerful than the individual. And I think there was a lot of um, you know, that sort of like blood brother type buy-in, you know, into, into running this business together. And, um, I think if you don't have that solid partnership, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to run a successful business. I, I think I would, I think people see through it if, if it's not a strong partnership. Yeah. It's kind of, very obvious pretty quickly, I, I think, especially for your employees. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know when it came to this time in your journey where you're just two or three employees beyond the, the, the founders mm -hmm. um, and, and you are coming to this conclusion, we need to kind of professionalize this. We need to replace ourselves as the ringleaders here. Were you all in alignment around that decision? I, we were because we were um, that you know that was also the moment where you know the the business was starting to show you know sort of fruits of the labor to date and it just whets your appetite for more of that right so when you combine that with this mindset of we have to keep growing the business because we know that's how um, this business needs to be run mm -hmm. right and you whet your appetite with financial success of it. It's, it's it's pretty easy to kind of put the two uh, together and say, okay, here we go. Let's do this. We're going to keep growing this. Um, you How'd know, you guys split it, up the equity? With 30, 30, 33 and a third. <laughs> yeah. So everybody was sort of even. Yeah. Keel. Yep. You mentioned 
you know, there was a, a way that you incentivized your team uh, to avoid the short-term thinking. And, mm -hmm. and in some freight forwarding company or, or brokering companies, there's this like, hey, you got to get a, you, you got to hit a certain profit threshold every day. And that can drive bad behavior among the employees. How did sure. you, by contrast, choose to incentivize people to play the long game? So um, the, the incentive base was, was, you know, was a, you know, commission based on, you know, a share of the commission on the, you know, profit of the business. And that structure uh, de definitely rewards short-term thinking. So what you, what you have to do in your, in your training and you have to embed in the culture of really the customer lifetime value and the value Is that what of you guys did? How did you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and it's just, it's not a, it wasn't a, you know, hard sort of data driven fact. It was just more of these anecdotal evidence, evidence of, hey, you know, remember this account and they're, you know, we used to do all this business and they're gone. You've got to, you know, you've got to take care of your customers. You've, you've got to grow these relationships. You know, you need to make sure that, you know, that they're around, you know, years down the road from now, right? So what am I doing today that is, uh, you know, uh, putting everything in my power to make sure that they're around right uh, uh, down the road. But I'd be curious to know how to, how do you do that practically? Because I'll tell you, I'll tell you a personal story. So we uh, we use a um, currency trader to 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 trade currency because we deal with a bunch of different currencies, and it's always the same. The the the, the broker, the currency person, mm -hmm. will kind of hook us with a really competitive rate, and we're like, oh man, that's an incredible rate. Um, let's use these guys for currency trading. And, and so they kind of do a couple of trades. And again, we'd, we'd verify that they're, you know, like really competitive and, and sure enough, they'd be really competitive. And then we'd fall asleep for a year, use mm -hmm. the same broker again and again and again. And little did we know the margin was getting fatter and fatter and sure. fatter over time as we got lazy and just complacent. And then all of a sudden we'd, we'd get a rate and be like, that's not competitive. And we'd go back and realize, oh my God, he's been totally screwing us for like a year because <laughs> he got us on the cheap rate. And then he just kind of took our loyalty, at, like the advantage. Sure. Sure. So like brokers, I mean, they're coin operated, right? Like they are mm -hmm. going to go for the profit. So it's one thing for you to say, look at the long-term value, but you must have had yeah. some system in place that enabled you to capture, like police these right. guys from so, so the, the, the customer. The classic example of your question is, um, you know, the, the, the trucking market is a supply and demand market. And so there is no you know, we're not certain what we're going to um, hire a carrier for on a certain shipment, but in advance, we are giving the customer a price on that shipment. So what that means is, and, and, and the reality is there are often moments where we've, we've miscalculated, we've misestimated, a snowstorm hit, um, whatever it might be that impacts the, the, the flow of trucking in the United States, we guess wrong, right? So what do we do uh, when we're wrong? Well, we're going to are, are we going to say, nah, you know what, I can't pick that up today because I have no one that is available at the price I thought. That's not what we do. We say, you know what, I told you uh, we're going to get this done for you. Um, you know, our costs were higher than expected, but you know what, we're paying this carrier more than what I'm invoicing you for the shipment because your business is important and because I want to do business with you tomorrow, right? So that's an example of, you know, sort of operationally how... Um, you know, things would happen in our world and how we lived up to our end of the bargain, right? So, um, you so know, that was hardwired into your business model. You oh, yeah. You yeah. Didn't had to go. You had to take care of your customers. You had right. to execute because there's 20 something thousand competitors in the space. They would easily, you know, the switching cost is low. So that's why I said, you know, every shipment is, is your audition for the next one. So if, if you fail the audition, you're not getting called again, right? And you didn't want that to happen. And as it, and 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 I've learned right. It's you know the the uh, you know the, the cost of finding a new uh, customer you know is multiple times um, you know the revenue of one right. So you can't you can't throw these relationships away over you know one you know snowy day in January right. You've got to get the business done. You've got to take care of the customer. And 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 that's what I, that's what we learned and that's what was successful and. We had sticky relationships and they stayed with us because they knew that we would take care of them. And, and they knew that our competitors weren't doing that, right? And they would test and they'd come back. 
Interesting. And how did you stay in touch with customers when, you know, by default, they don't need you when they don't need you, right? Like, so if they don't have anything to ship, they Mm -hmm. don't need you. So how did you sort of elegantly stay in touch, stay top of mind until they needed you? So many industries that you can stimulate demand. Hey, we're going to have a sale tomorrow on this product. Why don't you come in? But if I've got nothing to ship, you can't stimulate demand. I've got nothing to ship. How did you stay in touch? Yeah. And I found too that when the more that you poke them, you know, the more they felt like they were being sold and that didn't, that didn't, um, you know, that didn't end in a good way. So I was trained to, to really be high touch through the transaction, right. And really slow the transaction down. So many of our competitors are looking to remove touch from the process. We were trying to put as much in it. And that was a differentiator for us, right? Because then I never, you know, I was just always kind of right there, top of mind. And I was always in touch versus, hey, what, you know, what do you got going on today, right? This sort of, you know, like a puppy <laughs> breathing on you, right? Like, um, I didn't want to be that. So, you know, we intentionally, um, you know, uh, had more service touch points during the transaction and, um, you know, kind of kept that dialogue open. And it, I felt like that was a more organic, non-salesy way to stay in front of the client. Got it. Got it. So how big did you get this business before you decided to sell it? Like in terms of uh, your revenue or number of employees or whatever? Process? Yeah, we were approaching about 200 employees um, in 2021. Got um, it. And uh, we were uh, moving anywhere from about 1,000 to 1,100 shipments per day at the time. So 200 employees, what was the breakdown of brokers to office people? Like how, how did you... How was that 200 employees broken out? Uh, we, including the, the owners, we had less than 10 people in administration. So it was almost all, all brokers on the floor uh, trying to help customers, um, you know, lo- looking for new opportunities, executing existing commitments. Wow. Very lean You've got 190 brokers who manage a relationship with their customers. Mm-hmm. And, and so just 10... Sp- admin staff sort of on the back end running the company. Mm -hmm. Wow. Huh. And what was keeping the 190 brokers loyal to you? Because they've got a skill set. They've got a book of business. Sure. Why wouldn't they just leave like you did and go start their (laughs) own brokerage? I um, took the lessons that I learned leaving um, that large company to say, well, you know, why did I leave? What made me look? Um, because I didn't want, you know, an em- employee like myself, you know, having those same thoughts, right? So the things that we did, you know, I was certain that they would struggle to find a, a competing, uh, you know, compensation package and sort of W-2 than what they were getting with us, right? Maybe, and maybe you could beat it by a couple bucks, but you weren't going to beat the, uh, environment of success, the support um, for you know the business that you were running, um, and we also gave a lot of latitude to get business done, and and uh, especially our more senior people. I mean, they're professionals in the space, so y- you don't need my approval to make a decision to take care of that relationship, right? That's the other piece. Hey, I want to you know go see them. I want to get on a plane and go out there and and check in with them, or I want to you know. We have this problem. I need to, you know, I need to rectify it. You know, why would I put a budget on making a client happy, right? Um, if, if, if said client is, you know, has been with us for years and you can see that revenue stream, you know, out in the future, why, why would I jeopardize that over, you know, uh, a fraction of that revenue today on a, on a cost today, right? So, you know, you getting back to that things? earlier conversation. Yeah. Did you make them sign non-competes? Uh, yes, they did have yeah. non-competes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So they've got non-competes, so they can't go directly in. Although in some states, you know, I think I think it's hard to get those non-competes to hold up. Yeah. Yeah. So what would your turnover be of brokers in a typical year? Like if you had 190 starting the year, how many would, mm-hmm. would, would typically stay with you by the end of the year? Well, I try... I, I tried to look at this challenge and listen, I, 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 my experience, every business, right, deals with turnover and it's one of those, uh, you know, thorn in your side. And, and, uh, uh, I looked at it in a different way. 
I looked at our sort of tenure track, right? So anyone um, with greater than say one or two years experience in our business, our turnover in that segment was near zero. Hmm. And, and because we spent so much time um, or so much energy around building a, um, a, a model in a, in a company they could work in where they could be successful and they felt empowered. And I, I wasn't so concerned that they were going to leave. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I mean, I, I think we built a good system for them to, you know, accomplish their goals and to grow. But there is significant turnover in the freight brokerage space. And that's that, you know, sort of try it out, try it on phase sure. for someone entering the business. Frankly, it's a quirky business and it's not a great fit for everyone's skill set, right? So I was at peace with that. And, you know, we certainly um, did our best to, um, you know, to, to find the right matches and to, you know, look for uh, characteristics that have been successful for previous, you know, hires. And there is going to be turnover in the business, but I found it's really right in that sort of startup um, spot. Two two follow on questions. The, the the ones who made tenure, like the the, the kind of tenured professor, the mm-hmm. tenured broker who who was loyal and and you know, two plus years experience. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you do to retain them beyond what you've already shared? You know, make giving them latitude to kind of make their own decisions, honor their commitments. I mean, did you have? Uh, stock options or stay bonuses or incentives that sort of tied them to the business? Uh, you know, we had a, you know, 401k platform and, and, and the matching and the like. Um, mm-hmm. I felt like that was table stakes to run a business where, you know, you had people coming to work. Um, what I really tried to, you know, cement, um, you know, in, in the, the sort of message about, you know, working in our company was, you know, your your profit sharing is 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 at your desk every day, right? That um, you, you know, right on in the front door, you're getting a share of the profits, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I really tried to um, you know try to try to reinforce that message, and then especially in the hiring um, conversation, specifically point and say, hey, you see that um, you see that person across the way, you know, they were in this same interview room four years ago, here's been their path, here's how they've been successful, here's what they've done, and here's what that success means. So when you can you know, show that tangible example of success and, and how people can thrive, and you know, there aren't a lot of businesses that someone can go work for or, or someone can interview with and, and get that exact um, you know, uh, sort of model of how to do it, and there's someone doing it, and they were in your shoes, and you know, here's the path. And um, that was very, that turned out to be very successful for us. And What's the secret to getting people from the less than two year tenure up to the, to the more established, like how did you train them, motivate them? I think a lot of people listening to this struggle with salespeople who uh, there's just a lot of turnover in mm-hmm. their kind of young of t- sales team. Uh, you know, they don't know how to hire properly. If they hire people, they kind of, Oftentimes yeah. they leave quickly. So what's the secret of getting the right people into the into sure. bus in the first place? Well, I think the first part is you said the word right people. So you can't, you can't fake that and you can't change that, right? So it, it has to be the right person. How did you right? figure that out in your company? Like, was there a question that you love to ask, which was kind of a bit unusual that a not do to identify the right person. It's as much an art as it is a science. And, you know, we had turnover in that beginning phase. So we, we failed on it as well. Mm. You know, you have, you, you, you know, um, you, you know, you have to, or I, I found that we, um, were most successful, um, you know, in that hiring slow firing fast type mindset of, you know, if it's, it, it wasn't a fit for us, um, you know, it's, it's, not a personal thing. Uh, and I can't change what the market needs for us to be successful in this business. Right. So, um, I, I wasn't able to, um, change that. And I think, um, I found a lot of people kind of self select in that process anyway and say, you know what? Um, I'm uncomfortable here. I'm going to, I'm going to look elsewhere. I'm going to look for other opportunities. So, um, you know, it was as much of a sort of, you know, it's both, it's both of us not feeling it and, you know, it, it kind of, um, you know, resolves on its own. Um, yeah. I think, I think the other part is when you do find the right person, you need to take care of them and you need to set them up for success. And I think we are really good at that where, you know, 
I referenced before, we had only a few people in administration. So we relied on our senior people to be mentors and trainers. And um, did you and, pay them for that? Well, we, we paid them by putting labor around their business to help grow their business. So okay. indirectly, we did because uh, we it. invested on, in their teams and um, gave them the resources to be successful. And, um, you know, and it was it was a, that became a win win that the leaders enjoyed the opportunity to help mentor people and to and to um, do something a little different than selling every day, day in and day out. Right. It gave them a new challenge of how do I how do I get this team moving at a, at a, at a better pace and how do I um, get the most out of my teammate? And, um, you know, really, I think gave them, gave the senior person more buy-in into the overall organization. And then from the junior person's perspective, well, I'm sitting next to the senior person. I know that, you know, their paycheck is crazy. I want something like that. I'm going to listen to everything they tell me and I'm going to do what they do. And I'm going to parrot, you know, their best practices. How much in freight brokering? Like, I'm sure there's kind of crazy, like, mm-hmm. uh, edge cases. But like, what would a, a typical high performer in freight brokering, not necessarily just at your company, but just in sure. the industry, what would a high performer kind of clear in a given year? I, I would say the sort of, you know, the, the one and 2% are north of uh, 300, 400, $500,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. They're, they're, they're making it and they're successful. And the average? Um, huh, that's a tough question. I always thought, um, I looked at it as if, if you were able to get to $100,000, you had, that was the moment. To me, that was the conversion moment. So it was year one, year two, but it was really that, you know, I hired you in at 40, 50, 60 grand, depending on what year we're talking about and inflation and all that. But, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I got you, if I got you from 50 grand to 100 grand, I, I think I was going to, I think we were going to keep going on that track. And I think I was going to get you to 200, right? That was my mindset of, you know, how many people in our business are we paying 100 grand to? Because that to me was that we made it over the hill, we made it over the hump there. Yeah, it makes so much sense because I think about other industries where, you know, the the constraint on growth is just how can we get more salespeople? Like I think of real estate brokerages, right, where there's nothing really I mean, the, the broker kind of eats what they kill. They, they, or the mm-hmm. real estate agents eats what, what they kill. So, it, you know, like there's no constraint other than like, how do we convince more real estate agents to join our brokerage and, and not the one down the street? And so right. hearing how you think about it is super helpful. Yeah, I, you, I, I found that we had to create an environment, you know, when you're thinking about hiring someone at an entry level office job and, you know, here's our package and here's what we're doing. I I thought, you know, I looked at the competition of, you know, who who else is hiring next to me and I have to make this an enjoyable place for that entry level person to come work, right? So, um I found that that entry level person is measuring the company in a different way than the person that's suddenly making 100k or 200k. Suddenly they don't care that you know, there's almond milk in the fridge as well as, you know, uh, shelf stable creamer, right? That's not important to them because they're all eyes on the paycheck and what do I need to do? But, you know, we created an environment that people wanted to come work. Um, and I think that, you know, they walked in our office, we had invested in the space and it was clean and modern and, you know, there was good daylight and, uh, you know, new computers and that sort of, you know, they, we, we showed them a workstation in an environment where they were comfortable and happy and, you know, um, they felt welcomed. But and all I that think stuff that was important. cost money. How did that impact your profit margin? Again, I think about middleman type businesses and their profit margins tend to be fairly skinny. Did, were you able to, to you, are you able to share what your profit margin was uh, or, or, uh, you know, how, how you thought about. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't get into details around that, but w- I think you have this race car of a business, right? So why would you, why, why would we want to put the cheaper fuel inside of it? Right. If that makes sense. I guess that's my analogy of um, we, we ran a, a high octane business. And so we didn't, you know, um, you know, we didn't skimp on the, uh, the resources, the expenses, what it needed, what the business needed to be run. We didn't skimp on that stuff um, because 
we knew that the, the, the more we took care of the business, the more we invested in the business, the greater the top end would be. And, and that proved itself year in and year out. Um, I, I mean, certainly there are business expenses that are, that are not, you know, don't, don't drive investment and don't drive dollars to the future bottom line. But I'm talking about, you know, the things like a comfortable work environment and uh, a nice office and a place people want to walk into, uh, you know, company events, um, you know, training, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, lunches, dinners, whatever it might be. Right. I, I, I didn't want to shortchange that stuff. And I, I didn't want our people to feel like we were cutting corners on things that, you know, impacted their world um, because that sends a bad message. Of all the things you did to kind of retain these these new uh, brokers who had not yet hit the hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollar a year kind of threshold, what had the biggest impact? The biggest impact is the is that the global strategy of we're running a growing business. Everyone's bought into that because everyone can can get some skin in the game, right? So, so that's the first piece, and the second piece is is that they you know had. Okay, I work for this company with yeah almost 200 people, but I've got this team of four or five people that I work with day in and day out, and I look up to them, and I, you know, um, you know, work elbow to elbow with these folks, and we just, um, you know, we're we're in the the foxhole together, and these are my partners, and um, I think that that those uh, relationships that um, were forged were um, a big part of people's work experience, and um, you know. Um, I think I think that was one of the critical uh, pieces of success for us. Makes sense. There's that old expression, you know, you don't leave a company, you leave your manager. So you you created these pods or these teams mm-hmm. that they were working with their more senior colleagues. Let's get into the actual sale itself. So you'd reach two hundred empl- almost two hundred employees. Um, well, like, was there some sort of trigger that made you want to sell, or what, like what happened? What 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 happened? Sure. Um, we uh, had worked for um, a platform company for um, you know since inception. We were in an agency for a platform company, and I I think uh, there were um, sort of two key pieces to the puzzle. The first is that the, the size of the business uh, you know had had grown to a, a point where it was you know a, a material thing for them, and it was a material thing for us. They didn't um, I, I I believe they didn't want to risk ever losing us. Um, and losing that revenue and 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 these um, client relationships and and everything we had built. What um, held you to that agency? The the agency in question, I wrote it down. Is it SunTex TT? Yeah, it was originally called SunTech and later, uh, you know, uh, run by Mode Transportation. Mm-hmm. So what? So you were an agent of SunTech, mm-hmm. which means that you use their technology platform. Their platform, to yeah, their their back end platform. We handled the front end of the business, so we did all of the client and carrier. Facing, yeah. um, you know, uh, business functions, and they took care of, um, you know, the technology, the uh, billing, APAR, um, that piece. Mm-hmm. Okay. So really, we were pre-delivery; they were post-delivery. If you think about it in that sense. Yeah. Okay, that's super helpful. Um, and what was tying you to them? Did you have like a multi-year contract? Yeah, we, we worked mm-hmm. under multi-year contracts. There've been multiple renewals. Um, you know, it, they were a good partner to us, um, always have been. Um, we had great relationships with the executive team, w- wasn't broke and didn't need to be fixed. So yeah. we were happy being there. So the, so you're, so that makes sense. So, so you, you've grown to almost 200 employees, which is material for SunTech. That's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, these guys are a big agent of ours, like bigger than most on our network, our mm-hmm. platform. Equally, you were a big company. You and your partners felt like, oh man, we we're, we're now like a real thing. <laughs> like, right. It sounds right. like you're like a like you both came to that real. Yeah, we're all grown up. Um, yeah, I I think what became important for me to answer your question is that um, you know I watched I I watched a lot of people go from walking in the front door on the first day to uh, establishing careers. I watched people get married, have families, buy houses. Uh, and it suddenly dawns on you that the business is bigger than you. And I, you know, hate for it to be that sort of, um, you know, sort of self-centered of a thought, but at some point it's like, Oh no, there's a lot of, a lot of people rely on this business and this is really important. It isn't just about, 
you know, my future, my well-being, it, you know, there's a lot of people who rely on this and this is bigger than us and something real. And um, we have a responsibility, um, you know, for their best interest. They're a stakeholder in this business. And that um, became important for us, I think, in the process. And, um, you know, it was important for us as, you know, a business of three partners to find an outcome that um, took care of all the stakeholders of this significant size business at this point. So, um, you know, uh, the way we got it done checked all those boxes and so that was that made it an easy path to go down for us because we knew it was um the uh, sort of lowest risk scenario for succession in the business so you're let me see if i can pressure test something here and make sure mm-hmm. i got it right so so you and your two partners you start this business you're like we can do this better than 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 my old company you start off in the early days it's a wealth creation thing, right? Like on one hand, you got a paycheck. On the other hand, no, we're going to create the high octane business and we're going to get wealthy. Like this is part of, like mm-hmm. part of the, the kind of motivation. And if I'm hearing you correctly, at some point, you're like, I, like, I feel pretty good. I'm going to get well taken care of here personally. But you, you started the, the realization that this is bigger than just your own personal sure. wealth creation event this was like something you you were am i getting it right basically like yeah and i I think it's you know that idea kind of came to be before we ever thought about selling the business is sort of a you know i opened a business thinking wow i'm gonna you know i'm I'm, this is gonna make me rich right this is i'm gonna do it myself and this is my path to to you know financial success well you know, for every incremental dollar, you receive less happiness, right? And and at some point, you're like, well, there's there's got to be more to it than this, right? And what, again, day one, make myself rich. You know, down the road, you realize, oh wait, no, I'm I'm seeing people come into this business. I'm seeing their lives change. That's bigger than me making an extra couple bucks a month, right? That that is fulfilling me in a way I didn't expect to be fulfilled, and Frankly, is more meaningful than the extra couple bucks in my pocket. That that was um, something that I will keep close to my heart long after you know decades from now. Um, God willing, um, that'll be what I feel was the most successful part of our business, albeit not the intended original intended um, goal of the business. Um, uh, for me personally, because- became most important. Greg, is that because along the way you were able to carve off some some dividends, some profits, kind of get the first couple of rows on Maslow's hierarchy of needs taken care sure. of for you personally? Like, were you like able to carve out some money? Or are you literally rolling all your retained earnings back in the business every year and you haven't taken anything more than your base salary for 17 years? You're like, <laughs> at some uh, point I'd like to get paid here. <laughs> yeah, no, I would say that we, I'm not... Uh, saying that we were, you know, um, living like monks, but, you know, we were very aggressive in reinvesting in the business it, 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 to a point where there definitely were moments where some of our salespeople would, were taking home more in a month than the owners were. And you've got to be okay with that. You've got to play the long game. Uh, that, that's what I've learned is, is that's the best way to run the business. How did that, you know? how did that, how did that play out with your spouse? Did your spouse kind of go, uh, Greg? Why are they making more than us? No, I, I, I don't think that was what reverberated for her. I think it was, um, you know, she saw the, you know, from her, you know, the window she was looking at into the business. You know, she she saw um, she saw the life changing events for people. She saw, oh, we came, you know, the Christmas party this year and. You know, last year it had 10 people. This year it had 25. You know, we need to have a bigger room at the restaurant this year, right? Or suddenly there isn't a, you know, I mean, we started flying people all to one spot. And, you know, suddenly we needed, um, you know, air travel to all get together. So she looked at it through a different lens and um, albeit maybe a healthier one at moments than the one I did. You know, for us as well, I think she saw, you know, this is taking care of our family and our life. And I, I was the biggest example of that i got you know i was a young single guy when the business started and when i left i had three kids and was married and um you know a homeowner and all that sort of stuff so i i live the example myself as well got it 
So let's go back to the decision. So you're all, almost a couple hundred employees. Suntech, you're a big agent of Suntech. So they're kind of taking notice and saying, okay, it's a big company. Was there some other sort of thing that happened with your partners that made you collectively say, yeah, I'd be ready to sell. Like I'd be, I'd love to go beyond the qualitative. Like it, we realized it was a, it was a real company. Like right. what did Sunset come to you? Did they, did, did you all have like a partner's retreat where you're like, we came to the conclusion. Was it some, was there some sort of straw that broke the camel's back? There, there wasn't necessarily a straw that broke the camel's back. It was a, it was a very, Soft ongoing conversation um, for a few years, um, mm. both internally with us and then with um, the SunTech leadership. Um, that platform did go through some changes um, as well. Um, and I think that that, um, from their perspective, probably um, spurred on, uh, went from talk to action and LOIs and whatnot. Um, you know, um, uh, I, we weren't able to sell a business if no one was coming to buy it. So I think that's the other piece is you don't always, you know, you know, talk, talk, talk. Well, you know, th the only way a deal gets done is if someone writes a check for it. So that was, um, you know, we were beholden to that timeline as well. Um, um, but we, um, I think, postured ourselves in those different conversations to say, you know, we're, you know, open for business and available to, to go down this route when, when, you know, um, when you're ready to. So we kept an open dialogue regarding that. Um, and, um, you know, we, uh, didn't eagerly look at external, um, you know, opportunities for acquisition or, or sort of, you know, um, harder deals to get done. So, did your agency um, agreement preclude you from looking at external acquirers? Like, yeah, but um, but we were coming near the end of of that agreement anyway, so it was sort of, you know, timing was in the air, right? Um, yeah, yeah, it was it was, uh, yeah. It so was, they didn't want to lose you as a correct agent, but also they didn't want to lose you to get acquired by somebody else either. Right. And right, so that sort right. of accelerated the timeline. That makes. That I, makes well, I, I, I would speculate <laughs> that, yeah. that that was the case. Yeah. I'm not yeah. certain. But it makes, it kind of makes, makes sense yeah. for sure. But, so, but we didn't have those, you know, we had a great relationship and it, those weren't conversations that we really wanted to entertain because like I said, it was all going great and we were headed down this, you know, happily ever after type path. So we, you know, really, um, you know, try to, try to, you know, stay, uh, in a lane that kept us headed there. We did an episode recently, uh, where one of the investors in the company said, look, great companies don't sell, they get acquired. So they position themselves to mm -hmm. be acquired, but they proact like they want the acquirer to make the first move. It sounds like that was the case. You kind of said, Hey, look, we're open. Like if that's yeah. something you want to explore, but you didn't go hat in hand to them and say, would you buy us please? You right. Know, just, right. You played your cards a little closer to the best. Exactly. Yeah. No, we, we went about our business day in and day out and grew our business and, you know, um, kind of live by the mantra that I had mentioned earlier about, you know, if you're not growing, you're going out of business and that was us. And, um, you know, I believe that made us an attractive candidate. I always believe that made us attractive. Um, and we certainly were an outlier, but, um, yeah, I didn't, you know, you do want to get the maximum you can for your business. So you've got to, uh, you do, uh, I felt like we had to play our cards right. And we had to, um, you know, be patient. <laughs> So if I'm, uh, if I'm interpreting the, the deal correctly, um, on, on one hand, things that would generally depress your valuation would be that you're an exclusive distributor of partner with SunTech mm -hmm. and that they would have permission to veto any acquire. So all those things would generally sure. depress the value of the company like enormously. Yes. On the flip side, things that would increase the value of the company were that you were coming up on renewal, that you were an attractive company that you could go to another platform uh, and choose to both 
partner with another platform and then ultimately get acquired. So you had these two competing forces, one sure. depressing your multiple, the other probably jacking it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you thought about it too? or? Yeah, I, I, we, you know, we certainly had limited options on the table based on our company structure of, of working for a platform, right? And so um, really there were three options. The platform we worked for could buy us. We could um, uh, go to another uh, platform, whether via acquisition or sign contracts with them uh, to be uh, uh, representing their platform. Or we could try to do the whole thing on our own from, from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that third option had the highest risk and the highest reward because that would have made us a much more valuable company. Option one, stay, staying at home and staying with the home team uh, was the low risk um, option. And, um, you know, that I think um, was what resonated with us the most is, hey, we've got a lot of people that rely on us. Um, this is a big business. Let's not, um, you know, there's no reason for us to be overly aggressive. Sure. Everyone can win. In this transaction and i think that's what we ended up doing that's the deal we got done is one where everyone won yeah great the the third option as i understand it if i'm correct if i'm if i'm interpreting you correctly is that you could have gone and built your own correct. software your mm -hmm. own platform effectively yes. and yes. replicate what suntech had yeah that makes yeah. sense so mm -hmm. it was do the deal with you know, the one who brought you to the dance, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, go find another platform or, or build your own platform. And That's you right. chose the, the former. What was the, um, and I know we have to be sensitive to, to the details around the deal itself. What was your reaction to their offer? Your personal reaction, like just qualitatively, how did you feel about it? I, I think when you, when you get an offer, um, it, it, you know, it's it, it kind of rocks you a little bit because you're like, oh, this is really happening, right? This is we're really going to do this, right? It's it, maybe uh, like when you you know uh, perhaps propose to your spouse, right? It's like one of those, uh, you know, or you go to buy a ring or something like that. You're like, wow, this is this is really that expensive. We're doing this. Um, you know, it was like one of those kind of seminal life moments. I felt like so. Yeah, it was um, a, a little surreal. Um, a little tense and uh um you know um it was it was quite the moment yeah how did your partners feel about it i think we all um reacted slightly differently um you know uh and it became a kind of a waltz for the three of us to get you know, we had for 17 years run a business where we really were fortunate to generally be on the same page day in and day out and have the same vision. And, you know, this was a moment where we really kind of all had to take a walk in the woods separately and, and come to terms with, you know, um, this is happening. And, and, you know, listen, there's a, a humility around it too that, you know, you're giving up control of this thing that you control and it's your baby and you've got to, um, you know, you're, you're giving someone else the keys to it and that, you know, suddenly you're not going to be the, the big cheese anymore. Um, that, that was a big thing for us to, to, to really process as well. Um, you know, and we're human, we have egos. So. Yeah, no, for sure. As we all do. So how did your partners kind of come down? Like usually when I've talked to people about partnership acquisitions, it's natural for, kind of one partner seat is this the best deal maybe we should go shop it mm -hmm. another might be like hey you know burden the hands worth two in the bush let's take the deal yeah. i'm ready to retire <laughs> you know like was there a little bit of that sort of like is this really or were you all like immediately no this is this is a great deal we were the the gamut of of those of those you know thoughts um mm -hmm. i um you know you i i i've, I've Maybe much like the real estate market, right? There's this sort of irrational pricing of your own house or, you know, so I, I found that we did the same thing with our business and, um, you know, we had to, um, you know, kind of stomach the fact that it, you know, wasn't as high as we had hoped. Um, but we also had to look at reality and say, the value of the business is the price that someone's willing to pay for it, not not the price that we dreamed it would be worth one day. And I think that's part of that reconciliation process of, 
you know, are we doing this? You know, what are you thinking about in the woods? And we each dealt with that differently. Um, How did you do it? Uh, I, I was the, you know, um, I was the bird in hand one. Um, I, I thought uh, they had provided us with um, a deal that was very fair. Um, and um, I thought the business was, it, it was time for a larger company to control this business because it just was, had grown so large. Um, I thought that was important. And, um, you know, it, uh, you know, perhaps the, the, the business required skills that an experience that none of us had had at that point. Right. Um, that was, you know, that was my first day <laughs> running a business of that size. Right. So, um, maybe someone else that had run a business slightly larger, uh, it was their turn to try to um, grow it. And, uh, you know, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of questions around valuation that we ask ourselves a lot here on this show. It's like, it's like, what's it worth? Uh, which you could point to third-party data sources or mm -hmm. previous other deals or whatever. And then there's the question of like what it's worth to you. Mm -hmm. And those two numbers can be very different, right? Yeah. What it's worth to you, uh, uh, if you're running your lifestyle through the business, it could be a, a much higher amount, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you guys didn't do that. In your case, you were pretty clean. You're very clean yeah. in terms of your, your P&L. So uh, I'm assuming, uh, you know, that, what it's worth to you conversation came down to like, you know, uh, is this a life-changing event for us? Does this allow us to yeah. go buy something? Like, did you have any of those kind of conversations where you're like, if we could get this for the business, that would mean for us as a family, fill in the blank. Did you have those yeah. sort of conversations with yourself? I, I, it, I, we did. And it was a life-changing um, event for us in the sense that, you know what, I know, you know, I know I'm going to be able to, send my kids to college. And, um, but I just know that the DNA that I have, um, I'm going to go back to work and I'm going to do something and I'm not going to, you know, um, you know, I'm not going to sit around and, and do nothing, which ironically is what I've done since, since I left the company, but I'm, you know, preparing for the next step now. So, you know, I, I, I've, I've gone out and proven to myself that I, I, um, you know, I, I recharge my batteries and it's time to get moving again. So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, I think, uh, you know, we, we all share that mindset of like want, wanting to have a purpose and wanting to have a mission in terms of what you do professionally. And, and that, you know, that's not defined by this deal, right? You're still, and that always inspired me looking at other people, right? Oh, you're, you know, you, you, you know, wh why does, um, Warren Buffett keep working, right? You know, it just, because it's, it's a challenge and it's what motivates you and, and engaging with people as you face these challenges, right? That, that, that's, um, you know, that's important too. And, and, uh, was there a fourth unspoken option in your exit, which was to do nothing, meaning just roll uh, over uh, there was the kind of kick the can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was an option as well. Um, I, I didn't like that option. I felt like, um, you know, our success had already been an outlier. You're looking at, I looked at, were we more likely to get a better deal from someone else in the future? Or are we more likely to be a smaller, less successful company in the future? And I was um, scared that we had so much outperformed normal that uh, we were likely to revert to the mean. And that was a scary say, concept yeah. for me. And I think the other thing too is, you know, a partner business, you can't take for granted, you know, the partnership and everyone's health and, you know, bad things, right? Who, you know, I just, sure. uh, we had had such a good run and, and a good fortune, um, uh, you know, to date. And uh, it just, it, it's, it seemed appropriate to, it was time to start hedging risks. Yeah. 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 When one way or another. With three partners, you triple the risk of some bad thing happening to any one of you. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and of course, we've already talked about this idea that at some point, this the middleman role may may become less valuable, you know, probably long, long into the future. But it's not inconceivable that that these types of brokering businesses may mm -hmm. become less valuable. So, hundred percent, the business yeah. is going to change. It will. Yeah. But maybe not in the time on the time frame that everyone thinks, right? Probably not as fast, but yeah, we wake up in 10 years. Yeah, it's going to look a lot different.
Than it tells it does me self-driving today. cars in a little bit. Like everybody knows yeah. it's going to happen, but it's not next yeah. week. But it nothing flying probably. through the air right now either, right? <laughs> We're not. Yeah, we yeah. don't have cars that fly. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, this has been great. I I'd love to ask you a couple of questions, um, little lightning round questions before I let you sure. go. Are you up for that? Yeah, hundred percent. Biggest mistake you made during the selling process, personally. Biggest mistake you made. Our show is all about trying to help people avoid the common mistakes associated mm-hmm. with doing something they don't do every day. So. What would you like to have a do-over on? Uh, I would have liked to have... Um, we, we spent a lot of time and energy uh, preparing our business to sell from a strategy point of view of how we ran the business and all that. We've talked a lot about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish we had done a better job of kind of having the financial piece of it in order so that we... Um, you know, we knew our numbers and our, you know, kind of clean and cold inside and out. You know, we were kind of navigating that on the fly and that was a little challenging for us. What specific number? I mean, I'm assuming you knew your your revenue and your profit. So were, there were numbers in like within the P&L? Right. But, you know, when you think about, well, you know, is, is, is this car or this expense part of the business or not? You know, and you start, you know, we weren't looking at the business the way in a, you know, financially the way an acquirer would look at the business until maybe a a little late in the ball game. And I think that, um, you know, uh, that, that made it a little more difficult for us to navigate through. Yeah. Great, great, uh, great advice. I've heard selling a business is like this emotional roller coaster. I personally (laughs) would, would, would concur. What was the low point on the roller coaster for you emotionally during the process? Well, uh, the the hardest thing to do was to walk out on my last day. So I uh, l- left, you know, after we kind of fulfilled all of our obligations, I left at the end of 2022. And, um, you know, that was uh, walking out of the office in tears. That was, that was pretty hard. This is a company you started. Yeah. Yeah. Like giving birth to a company, two hundred <laughs> and it's not it's not an insignificant size company. Yeah. What about the emotional high associated with selling your company? How would you describe that? What was the moment? Um, I think I think the high is when you, you know, the moment where you kind of get that you know sort of handshake that this is going to get done, and you're you know really starting to do the kind of final pieces of. Which stage so. was that for you? Because it wasn't the, the LOI would the letter of intent would have been mm-hmm. the first step, but then there was diligence. At, at what point did you have that elation, that that sense of euphoria, where you're like, no, no, this is actually going to happen? I think once we were really, I mean, you know, once you're going through the the, the contract of sale, uh, you know, the agreement, that, the actual written agreement, that you realize that you know uh, that. You've, you've done you've done the the hard blocking and tackling in terms of getting to an agreed upon number and you know what I felt confident that we had run you know uh, an above board business and done things the right way so um uh, you know we didn't they didn't find any skeletons there weren't any skeletons to find um and that you know I didn't have a sleepless night on that part of it you know so so it made that moment one of we're almost there, you know, push or push over the uh, finish line rather than, uh, you know, uh, maybe incredible deliberations between attorneys uh, trying to, uh, you know, hedge or protect interests. So we we didn't, it was, it was a pretty fast moving, um, you know, process because I I believe because we ran a clean business and, and approached a, um, you know, a, a sale with a amicable partner. Yeah, I want to make sure my listeners took full note of that. The letter of intent, which you'll sign early in the process, is you know a couple of pages, fairly superficial. The definitive share purchase agreement that Greg is referring to is you know it's a forty, fifty page document. It looks totally <laughs> different. And once you get that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work that's been put into that most likely, yeah. and so that that is a validating point. So that's. That's super helpful. And I, last question, what trophy did you buy yourself to commemorate the win? What physical, did, was there a, a car, a house, a guitar? I noticed the Gibson post. Nah, you. I guess what we, what we've done is we took a, uh, with the kids, we went to Italy for three weeks, uh, this past summer. So oh, great. finally, once I was, didn't have a vacation calendar to tend to and, um, nice. Uh, Where'd you go? Part of Italy? Uh, we did, uh, a week in, uh, 
um, a town south of Naples called Agropoli. And then we did Florence and Rome. Um, oh, and it was uh, really neat. Um, did some Airbnbs and uh, ate a lot of pasta, came back 10 pounds heavier. So uh, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> sort of, a, you know, a, a bucket list trip that would, you know, wouldn't have been able to have done, um, you know, in regular times. So took advantage cool. of that. Congratulations on, I'm sure the Thank kids you. will remember that for years to come. I, uh, I really appreciate you doing this, Greg. Thank you.